Okay, Leslie, we're recording now. Um, and um, thanks again for uh, chatting with me ab about the brothers, which, as you know, I, I've, I've loved that story for a long time. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and your work in, in general. And um, uh, anyway, I wanted to just talk about, um, I think I want to start with notions of like authenticity, how you um, how you make a story that you didn't yourself experience or that's not based on autobiography, right. how you go about making it seem authentic as though it's memoir and not fiction. Right. Um, well, I guess I would start by saying this idea of, you know, authenticity, realism, um, in the context of the brothers, you know, the authenticity that I was, I was looking for different kinds of authenticity, obviously. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trans. I, I don't have trans siblings. Um, and obviously there are trans characters in, in the story. So, you know, I, you know, I did what research, the kind of research that I felt was appropriate to do, which was to be in particular places um, where uh, there was a trans population, um, because I, I wasn't trying to embody a trans person. I was mm -hmm. trying to um, have, you know, trans characters who are critical to the story, um, but I wanted them just to be, you know, to be three dimensional, believable people. the The authenticity I was I, that I realized that I needed to go for was, you know, what what is it like to be someone who perhaps has trouble, you know, accepting someone who is trans or, or, um, you know, has a different orientation, sexual identity, et cetera. Cause the, the story to me is ultimately about the failure of the family and the narrator in particular, the failure of his failure to understand um, his trans sister's, uh, life and and desires and his inability to comprehend that she even though she you know she dies early she dies young um, his failure to understand that she actually for all of her challenges she actually had the fuller richer uh, multi-layered life and that he was the one who had really sort of you know marginalized himself and and lived this kind of sheltered existence. So the authenticity I was looking for was for the the one that I really had to focus on was the narrator um mm -hmm. and 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 his emotional experience and and how he might try to negotiate that with the experience of his trans sister but also his mother who is very who very much loves her children um but you know does a really awful thing to uh to her trans daughter at the end of the story. But I'm also hoping that, you know, I present her, the mother, authentic authentically too, because she is complicated. She is someone who um, obviously, obviously does wrong things at the end, but I hope that the reader can still view her with some kind of sympathy because she is of a different culture. She is a, of a different time. Um, so there are lots of, I guess different kinds of authenticity that I um, was trying to trying to figure out, um, but really the the my ultimate focus, my main focus, is the narrator. Great. Well, why did you choose to tell it from his point of view? Um, you know, I thought in early early drafts, and you know, this is an old old story. This is written in like two thousand two thousand one. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's probably not the kind of thing, uh, that I would do now. Um, but I did originally try writing it from, uh, the point of view of the trans sister. Um, but as I wrote it, um, I realized that what was happening was that I was having trouble figuring out her flaws to make her a more complicated character. She was almost too heroic, I think is what I, because everyone around her was, they were the flawed ones. 
you know, and it just wasn't, it wasn't a compelling story. And I, and I, and ultimately I thought, I don't know that I can pull this off. And a lot of the emotional dramatic focus in those early drafts was really, um, really on the brother who mm-hmm. just couldn't accept in, in many ways, couldn't accept her in life and then couldn't accept her in death. I mean, he's having trouble dealing with the fact that she's gone. Um, and because that was the more flawed and ultimately more complicated character that was appearing on the page, I thought, you know, maybe this is really about, uh, maybe this is a story about family failing. And I think he does fail her. Um uh, the mother fails her trans daughter. So I thought, well, what if instead of making them these peripheral characters, this is really a story about a family that fails to see who the real, I don't know, success in the family was um, and who really had the most fulfilling life. So that's how that yeah. came up. Right. Well, I want to... Um circle back to these sort of the complexities of the characters, but I, I wanted to ask you a, a practical thing. I, I know you wouldn't keep count, but about how many drafts do you think this went through and how long did it take? You know, I, I go through so many drafts. I mean, I would say at least, or at least 15, 20 drafts. Um, but I'm also someone who will write you know, five pages into a story, start all over from word one, maybe get up to seven or eight pages, start all over and go to 10 pages. So it's kind of hard to quantify, but um, at least, I mean, if we're really talking actual drafts are printed out and changed and uh, at least 20. Okay. Yeah. So um, back to the complex characters. Um, so you were looking to tell the story from the point of view of a character who was more difficult in than that is difficult in, or complex in the, all the reasons that they have for um, for acting the way the way they do, right? So, mm-hmm. so the the narrator is, as I see him, sometimes you know he's stuck between his loyalty to his sister and his loyalty to his mother though he ultimately chooses his mother, I guess, you know, um, by his, that act. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess um, I'm wondering sort of uh, were there, I mean, it's a long time ago that you wrote this, but are there any things about the narrator that you felt were surprising that made you sympathize with him more, that made you, um, that that you felt were, things that you hadn't, I mean, I guess I'm I'm wondering about this sort of journey from sort of a narrow idea of a person to a more complex one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with, with each draft, he became a more complicated, you know, nuanced character. And I think, um, I think the scene at the end you know, which is which is a difficult scene to write um, because it's so it's so violating toward mm. it's it's so violating of of of, of uh, Erica that's the, the trans sister um, of her body. Um, I mean, that was a scene I had to really think about and write over and over and 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 almost like a cho- almost like choreograph in my head. And when I realized that the, he was going to be. Edmund, the narrator, was going to be just physically so close to his sister, even though she's passed. I thought there, there's so many ways to write this, and there are, even though it's you're in a confined space and it's a very specific act, there's so many small gestures within that act that could be rendered. And and I think there's a moment, um, I haven't read it in a while, but I think there's a moment where he, I think he might even kiss his sister. At the end, yeah. At the end, yeah. yeah. And, and that apology. is something, yeah, I mean, that is something I, you know, I hadn't thought about way in advance. That was just a moment that I decided, would he 
would you do this? Just write it out and see if it feels right. Mm. And and I really had to ask myself, would he do this, given how repressed he is, given how torn he is, would he do that? And I thought, I think at I think he's reached that critical point where he would, because he he needs to and he wants to. Right. Okay. Great. Let's talk a little bit about Raquel and her um, function, if you will, in the story. Um, how did you bring Raquel into this story, or right. how did you? Why did you do that? You know, and I think initially, um, my my instinct was you need a kind of uh, proxy for Erica because mm-hmm. Erica has passed, um, but. I think she becomes more than that. I mean, she's um, she's kind of, uh, you know, she's going through a sad time. She's a little drunk in one of the scenes. She's, you know, a little emotionally messy because she's she's lost someone who she considers her sister. Mm-hmm. Um, and, who, you know, she also considers her like her only real family in the, in the States. Um, they're not real family, you know, biological family. Um, so I just thought Raquel was a way to just bring in a character who might say or do things that are maybe unexpected or uncomfortable in the context of of awake, essentially, mm-hmm. um, and to have Edmund interact with someone whose behavior or whose uh, whose you know, uh, yeah, who's, 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 he, he just can't predict what she's going to be like. I mean, he's in this place where all these old family friends and extended family are appearing. He feels like he knows all these people. He has nothing in common with them. He's just going to be his usual silent self. And suddenly there's this woman, Raquel, who, who knows his sister really well in ways that obviously he never did. Um, but he's, she's also someone who really engages him and ask some questions um, in ways that no one else is. Um, but, you know, I also didn't want her just to exist as someone who was going to, you know, be his kind of, you know, political awakening, let's say. Okay. Um, so I didn't want her to be kind of, you know, flawed and and, and, a, and a little messy. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, she became more than, you know, the living embodiment of, mm-hmm. and, she, and she's not even that, obviously, you know, um, of, of his sister. Okay, great. Um, why why did you start um, the story the way you did with um, the TV program where um, Erica sort of flashes, you know, her breasts at the mm-hmm. national audience and Edmund is watching and all that? What? What what I know it's hard to sort of reach back twenty years and say this is why I did it, but but yeah. just what what do you um, think that 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 sets up? In the right. Story? Well, I think at the time, again, this was written a long time ago. You still had those you know really awful exploiting shows like Jerry Springer and and, and Jesse Raphael, and- yeah, Ricky Lake, and and I think for a lot of people, a lot of Americans, that was that might have been their first, perhaps only um, uh, access or exposure to, you know, trans individuals, because it was it was considered such a sensational thing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, by the by, by by the larger culture. And I thought, well, that would make sense. That would be. And it was also, I think, one of the ways that um, that 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 the trans community could garner, you know, mainstream attention. You know, there wasn't, they, they, they rarely had a, a, a complicated, intelligent, um, generous platform back then. You know, it was a relatively, you know, narrow culture. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, that that is, I mean, when I was at the time, I thought, well, this is, you know, a lot of people's exposure to, to trans individuals. And I thought, well, maybe that is how they finally see Erica. I mean, it's unfortunate. It's not. It's not ideal, but it is. It is. Um, you know, it, it it was a phenomenon back then. And I also think it, it's also it's also so much because um, uh, Erica's mother is so concerned about um, public image 
and and perception. Mm -hmm. I mean, to she doesn't even want to admit that she has a trans daughter, and suddenly she's on television. I just thought that was a way to amp up tension from the start, um, while also doing it in a way that somehow. I don't know if this is my intention at the time, but but I do think it somehow addressed the larger culture and the larger culture's treatment of of the trans community at that time. Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, one other thing I just wanted to ask you about was the ending. You know, um, um, I know. Well, I guess did you have trouble finding a spot to end the story? Did you find? Did it take a while to find that ending? It did. And in fact, um, at, at a certain point, I got to that ending, but I kept it went on for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my teacher at the time, I was in a workshop at the time, um, John LaRue, rest in oh. peace. Um, he took his red pen, I think, and just said, drew a line and said, your story ends here. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're I think, yeah, you're right. So I just, I, I ended it where John LaRue told me to end it. Really? Wow. Okay. So, um, and that, why does uh, Edmund though go back to the apartment? Uh, and, you know, to, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not asking you to interpret um, yeah. the ending or go beyond what you've written, but why, um why do you think it was important for him as a character in your mind to go back mm -hmm. and, you know, to, to go and, you know, see Raquel? I think had I ended it where, you know, in the morgue, had I ended it there, I think it would have shut the story down. Um, because I think so much of that scene really is about, well, it's really about, it's that Erica and it's about her body. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, ultimately, this is Edmund's story. Yeah. I think by having him go, I, I think in that moment when he, I don't even know how much he's thinking about it. I think he just sort of finds himself in the car and thinks drive and makes his way to the Bay Bridge and thinks go to Raquel. That I don't, I think he's going for her, hoping for some solace. I, I imagine he's hoping for some understanding he may go and confess what he's just done. He may not confess. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and some readers have wondered if there is a possible, like maybe even romantic connection there that maybe he wants to pursue. I don't, I, I, I don't think that's outside of the realm of possibility, but I, I certainly don't think that's what he's thinking in the moment. Um, but I think for him to get in the car and get back, try to make his way to Raquel's, that was, that was my way of, of making clear this is really about Edmund and his loss, um, what he thinks he needs, what he hopes he might, you know, get from 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 talking to from talking to um Raquel even more. I mean, I think I think for him to talk to 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 engage to engage Raquel even more is to hopefully connect with his sister in ways that he obviously can't anymore but i also think he wants to get to know raquel for who raquel is as, as well yeah i think that's really cool though how you say i think this is what he wants i think this is what he wants i mean the in a way the writer a, after you've written the end you don't necessarily know what your character is going to do next yeah or, or even finally what their motivations are um, that's sort of up the, to the reader. So I can see where someone would uh, easily say, uh, okay, well, maybe he is attracted to Raquel, you know, yeah. that, you know, I can see that, but I can also see that's not it at all, you know? Right. You know, so, um, uh, and I think that's the, the pleasure of reading and hopefully writing complex characters is that they, start to seem to live beyond you the author yeah i mean i think if you fully understand your character then i don't know you've kind of deflated them to some extent i mean you kind of hope that there are aspects of your characters that you don't fully understand mm -hmm. um, and that you never you never want to be able to diagnose them you never you never want to be able to 
be definitively clear why they do something or why they don't do something. And so, yeah, I, I think having that bit of uncertainty is um, is what actually makes the character more alive. And makes the story character. story more alive too. That kind of ambiguity, so the reader can sort of ponder it. Yeah, that's yeah. the hope, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I've always thought of that having almost two endings. There's the ending in the morgue, and there's the ending. Uh, at the apartment and for, for me I've because I could I I well, the first time I read it I remember reading and thinking oh is this the ending you know um because it had that kind of slowing down where you felt you know the the bending to to kiss his sister mm -hmm. and and after you know uh and and then it goes on and I think that's I, I've always liked that because it it thwarts your expectations uh -huh. you know, I mean I think as a reader I expected it to end after that but I completely see why you didn't and it perfectly works but uh, but I guess uh, the last thing I just want to ask you is about expectations and how you thwart your own expectations and your reader's expectations when you write a story yeah god that's a good question um you know, I mean, I, th I think sort of like, you know, the death of any story is predictability. So you don't want to, I mean, I think it's fair. I think every writer, well, I, I won't say this is true for every writer, but for me anyway, I think it's important to have a sense of what a reader might reasonably expect in terms of a story's ending. Mostly in the context of, you know, external drama. You know, if you set up a story that's, you know, about uh yeah so if it's about a funeral then maybe you, they the reader has a right to at least see that funeral or conclude at that funeral so i i always want to i i always think about well what can a reader reasonably expect and what of those ex expectations um should i meet but where do i go beyond that or how do i render those expectations or how do i meet those expectations but render them in scenes that are still surprising. So even if we end up where logically we the story has to end up, that still has to be rendered in a way that they don't expect or that are that's at least surprising and nuanced. Um, and hopefully within that scene, there are small gestures or actions that um, perhaps get a, a, a kind of emphasis that really I don't know, surprise the reader that 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 make that scene read in a way they they would not expect. So I I, I think in terms of thwarting uh you know reader expectations um or assumptions, I think you need to consider what those actually are and ask yourself, okay, one, should I even meet them? And two, if I do meet them, how can I still render them in ways that they would not expect? Yeah. But that, that still feel true to the story. Right. Again, that sense of authenticity, you know, that we began with, you know, the that you want those gestures to feel authentic. You want to feel the thwarting of expectations to feel authentic and not just sort of like, oh, I'm going to do, do this now. Right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. This has been really informative and I really yeah. appreciate your time and everything. Of uh, course. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, I will, uh, if you want, I will uh, happily share a copy of this recording with you. I'm going to put it up on my little YouTube so I can um, have my class look at it and, and oh, others. Cool. Okay. okay, great. Okay, thanks so much. All right, take care. Good, Good seeing you again. Seeing you too. Bye. Bye.